This video is about the Retain GP scheme, which was launched in 2017. I was involved in running the Retainer scheme in the Northeast for a number of years and was also involved in advising the National Working Group that drew up guidance for the new scheme. There are large numbers of GPs leaving general practice, as you can see here, and there are peaks at different ages. So female GPs leave in large numbers in their 30s and early 40s and male GPs leave in the pre-retirement years. The factors that contribute to this are well known for female GPs caring responsibilities for both peaks burnout. Early retirement contributes uh, and the, the uh, tax and financial decisions around that. And also we know that development of a second portfolio also contributes to this. Let's look at who's eligible to join the scheme. There are three criteria. First of all, it, it must be a GP who's considering leaving or has left general practice, but is still on the medical performers list. So this includes people who have uh, personal health problems or caring responsibilities, who are approaching retirement and are considering retiring early, or individual GPs who have a, another substantive role and therefore require greater flexibility in their GP work. The second criteria which must be met is that um, their requirements for flexibility cannot be met in a regular part-time role. And uh, that may be, for example, due to the need for annualised hours, term time working, uh, or long periods of absence, uh, for example, to do voluntary work. The third criteria is that there is a need for additional educational supervision. So this might be, for example, because they have become uh, isolated from their peers or they're newly qualified or other reasons. So looking at the funding side of the retained GP scheme, if we look at the practice and the retained GP aspects, the practice receives £76 per session, uh, which is the equivalent of approximately £4,000 per employed session per annum. The retained GP receives a bursary of £1,000 per session per annum, and this is for educational and professional costs. So things like GMC subscription, BMA, RCGP, indemnity and course costs. This is paid to the retained GP net of tax by the practice. The retained GP is employed by the practice and can choose uh, between one and four sessions per week and uh, practices which is GMS or PMS are required to offer, offer the BMA model contract or terms no less favourable. The salary is negotiated between the practice and the retained GP. The guidance on the Retain GP scheme is available on the NHS England website and there is a full guide uh, covering eligibility and how it operates. And the BMA has also written comprehensive guidance which is on its website including a step-by-step -step guide and an FAQ document. The practices responsibilities under the Retain GP scheme are outlined on this slide and for this the practice receives £4,000 per employed session per annum. annum. And these include providing a suitable job plan, which is flexible, achievable, and provides integration in the team, an induction for the retained GP, one-to-one -one support from an educational supervisor for two hours a month. And this is to help facilitate their integration into the practice and ensure that their professional development needs are supported and also to avoid professional isolation. It's also a requirement that they support the retained GP CPD and notify the HE lead of any changes to the post. The retained GP's obligations under the scheme include all the usual things of maintaining GMC registration, uh, meeting the requirements of the medical performers list, maintaining adequate medical indemnity, undergoing appraisal and revalidation, and keeping their responsible officer informed of their being part of the scheme. They also need to notify the HE lead of any changes in their working arrangements, such as additional work or changes in domestic circumstances that may affect their participation in the scheme. Also to notify the scheme lead of long spells off work, such as maternity or sick leave. They're also required to submit an annual renewal form and to attend any events that are specifically organised for retaining GPs in their area. The retained GP is reviewed on an annual basis uh, by uh, HE and the local lead to determine whether they remain eligible to be on the scheme. Let's look at the rules regarding additional work. A GP entering the retained GP scheme is encouraged to keep 
a range of skills in their portfolio because we know that that helps to retain them in the workforce. So for example, retained GPs may, may work as an appraiser, as a gypsy, for example, dermatology, ENT. They may do commissioning work. They may work in education, teaching medical students and so on. They may continue to do out of hours work or walk-in centre work. The one thing that they're not allowed to do is general practice locums. There is an additional flexibility though to support individuals who want to continue to do extended periods uh, away from general practice like voluntary work abroad and this um, allowance uh, means that the retained GP can restrict their working uh, to 30 weeks of the year and this allows them to have these breaks uh, to pursue other interests. The approval process has um, a few steps. First of all, there's the completion of the application form, which is approved by the local AHEE lead, and this is then approved by NHS England. The retained GP CPD entitlement is based on the BMA model contract. So this provides for four hours per week for a full-time salary GP, and this is pro rata for part-time. The retained GP guidance talks about the need for a balance of in-house educational meetings, significant event prescribing meetings, quality improvement activities, balanced with uh, and against activities outside the practice, such as learning groups, e-learning, self-directed learning, talks, courses and locality protected learning events. It's important to note that the CPD entitlement excludes the time for supervision, which is two hours a month with the educational supervisor, and also excludes time for preparation and undergoing appraisal. The allocation obviously depends on how many sessions the retained GP is contracted for, as indicated here. This slide addresses some of the myths around CPD and its use. So first of all, not all practice meetings are necessarily CPD. They have a range of purposes around team communication, maintenance and development of the service, and they don't always have a primarily educational purpose or outcome. The other myth is that administration time is not necessarily the same as CPD. So doing dictation letters, labs and so on are not necessarily CPD. Not all CPD um, time away from the practice has to be necessarily allocated only when there are courses to be attended. It could be allocated, for example, as time in lieu for attending courses on other days of the week. Appraisal does not is not taken out of CPD time, nor is the monthly requirement to, to have two uh, hours with the educational supervisor for one-to-one -one support. There is no requirement to provide weekly tutorials by the educational supervisor. So. The overall message is that it needs to be flexible based on the needs of the doctor, not built into rigid blocks into the job plan, and time in lieu is an important component. To look at the CPD side of things, a retained GP who's working a day and a half a week, let's say on a Monday or on a Tuesday, will frequently find that the activities that they get involved with may well be on, at other parts of the week. So for example, they may attend their CPD group or learning group on a Wednesday evening. They may attend a CCG protected learning time event on a Thursday afternoon and may end up attending a course all day on a Friday over different periods of time. And so these all count towards a CP, their CPD and the way that this is recognised is by giving time in lieu from time within the practice. So to compensate, say, for that half day CCG learning time and the course, they will need to then take a, a day and a half off from the practice. The job plan is a crucial element to ensure the success of the retained GP post. The job plan needs to be individualised and based on the level of experience, abilities and needs of that doctor. There needs to be a balance of face-to-face -face clinical time and admin time, and it needs to include the opportunity to attend practice meetings. The retained GP should not be working in isolation or across several sites, which will deprive them of the opportunity of continuity with patients and with members of staff, and any revisions need to be approved by the HEE lead. If on-call is included, it needs to be calculated such that it doesn't ex uh, exceed a pro rata share, and this is explained in the guide. With respect to unpaid breaks, these are sometimes introduced into job plans but are not recommended. This is because uh, breaks are very rarely protected. They usually are a very important uh, time in the day the, the period between morning and afternoon surgery for communication between the retained GP and other members of the team. 
Uh, so the reality is that most retained GPs would tend to work through uh, the period between morning and afternoon surgery to keep on top of administration. It will just result in extra contractual hours and poten potentially exceeding their indemnity. In devising a job plan, it's important to, to note that a retained GP job plan is not simply a cut down version of the salary GP post. And indeed, this is explicitly one of the terms uh, for eligibility to the scheme, which is that simply a part time post doesn't meet the needs of the retainer. So a salary GP working three and a half days a week, uh, their job plan might look something like this. And uh, it's important that we don't automatically assume that the retained GP job will look uh, like a four session version of the se seven session version that the salary GP is doing. And this is partly because often uh, in salary GP, the actual hours worked can be considerably longer than what's down on paper or notionally in the contract. And so by just creating a cut down version, the retained GP is likely also to be exceeding the contracted hours uh, in this way. This problem is then further compounded when you build in mentoring time or attendance at a practice meeting, which further extends the day beyond that which is contracted and indemnified. For all these reasons, it's important not to create retained GP job plans based simply on the job plan of other employed doctors in the practice. It's important to remember that the session length of four hours and 10 minutes is uh, not a rigid template. So for example, retained GPs often have school aged children and may wish to work hours that fit in with the school day. So in this example, a retained GP contracted for three sessions per week is working those three sessions over two short days of six hours and 15 minutes. And their daily workload allocation in terms of appointments is reduced um, to uh, ensure that this fits in with those hours. There are several sources of support for doctors wishing to embark on the retained GP scheme and for practices interested in the scheme. There's the HEE lead in each area, there's the BMA Employment Advice Service, the local medical committee, there's a local sessional GP representative for each region, and for retainers and prospective retainers, there's a retainers Facebook page. You can find all the relevant documentation on these links, and please do send me your feedback to my email address or via Twitter. Thank you.